My name is Marcos Guarcina. I'm a senior scientist at UVIN. This is a joint work uh, with my amazing colleagues, uh, Pedro, uh, Pedro Adao from uh, University of Lisbon, Lorenzo Veronese, and Matteo Maffei from also UVIN. As you might expect from the title, we're gonna talk about cookies today. <laughs> cookies have a problem which is well known and they have weak integrity, okay? Uh, this is a problem also well encoded in the standard itself, the RFC 26265 uh, bis. Uh, this problem led to interesting research over the years. Uh, typical attacks that you can mount because of weak cookie integrity is session fixation, logging cross-site request forgery, more advanced cross-site request forgery attacks, and application-specific vulnerabilities. So just that we are all on the same page, this is a brief recap of what is cookie tossing. This is an attack that can be mounted from a same site position or from uh, uh, a network attacker. About same site, this is typically the case when you have a, a compromised subdomain. We got to use next paper two years ago, check it out, also the website is uh, can I take your subdomain name? Um, yeah, so the idea is that uh, if you have a, a subdomain that is controlled by the attacker, the attacker can forge a cookie into the victim's browser with a domain attribute. By setting the domain attribute to the apex domain of the site, then the cookie, the, the cookie is scoped to the entire site, so starting from the apex domain to all its subdomains. There is also the path attribute, which is interesting to mount cookie to tossing attacks because it can be used to prioritize cookies depending on the value of the path itself. Uh, so in this talk, we will focus on cross-site request forgery attacks. Uh, for like sake of correctness, we call them cross-origin request forgery attacks because we are in the same site context, okay? So the same site attribute in this case does not apply because uh, cookies are free to flow within the same site uh, even if you have same site uh, equal to strict. So you need something else to protect against these attacks uh, and we talk about the tokenization protections. Uh, the most common one is the double submit pattern because of its nature to be stateless. The idea is very simple. You have uh, an authenticated request towards an endpoint, uh, let's say like a post request, you have a cookie, in this case it's CSRF equal to X, and then you also attach to this request a post parameter. If at the server side the value of the cookie and the value of the parameter match, then the request is valid and it's accepted. Problem here is that uh, the cookie has no integrity against uh, a same site attacker. The attacker can do cookie tossing, overwrite that cookie, and then this pattern is easily broken. How to fix this? There is the synchronized token pattern, which is somehow similar, but the idea here is that you have a CSRF secret that is either cryptographically bound to the session or stored inside the session itself. And then if this CSRF secret is received at the server side, matches the value uh, of the CSRF token that is attached together with the request, then everything is fine. This looks okay in theory, but we analyzed the implementations of this pattern. And what we discovered was that uh, this CSRF secret uh, sometimes is not refreshed upon login. This leads to an attack that we dub as CORF token fixation, and we instantiate it here uh, against uh, Flask. So Flask is a micro web development framework that does not provide off-the-shelf support for user management and CSRF protection. You want these two things, take two libraries, combine them together, ship your application. So the idea of the, of the attack is the following. So we have a subdomain controlled by uh, an attacker. The attacker goes to bank.com, which is our target in this case, to the login page of bank.com and obtains uh, a non-authenticated session, okay? You can see in this case it's SES0 and the DID is set to none because the session is not authenticated yet. Together with that, inside the session, there is the CSRF secret S and also a CSRF token T0, which is compatible with the session zero that we just obtained. Second step of the attack, uh, the attacker does a cookie tossing, overwrites the cookie into, or sets the cookie into the victim's browser. Okay, this is similar to a pre-login session fixation attack. So setting SES0 into the victim's browser. Third step, 
the victim, Bob in this case, authenticates on bank.com starting from SES0 and then promotes their session to SES1 and you can see that the ID is set to the identifier, to the name of the user. Notice that the CSRF secret is still S, meaning that the token obtained at step one by the attacker, so T0, is still compatible and valid for the authenticated session of the user. And so the core attack goes through because T0 is valid for SES1 and the authenticated action is performed. We analyzed the uh, 13 of the most prominent uh, web framework uh, on GitHub, and we discovered uh, that seven out of them implements uh, a flawed uh, version of the synchronized token pattern. Okay, the, we, also un we also analyzed the, the usage of the double summit pattern, and we noticed that four of them were implementing this protection by default. So this was like the, the default, uh, uh, default protection. Most concerning thing here is that uh, session fixation attacks were found in three frameworks, and this is the most critical vulnerability because this leads to a complete uh, session hijacking. Uh, and in this case, uh, one of the culprits uh, was a library that is like Passport. It's a library for ExpressJS uh, with two millions downloads per week. So you can imagine the ramifications of these vulnerabilities. Now the question is, all these problems are introduced by lack of integrity of cookies. So can we just get better cookies without all these problems? To answer this question, we proceed in the following way. So we started by uh, revising the standard manually, this RFC 6265 bis, and then we implemented a browser testing suite for all known cookie tossing and eviction techniques. And we checked that against the three main browsers, so Firefox, Chrome, and Safari. Then we did something similar also for the servers. And so we tried to understand if there were discrepancies in the ways cookies are parsed at the server side. Whenever we found a discrepancy at the client side or at the server side, we went back to the standard to check what was the intended and the correct behavior. So let's start from the standard. There are two main changes um, to cookies in recent years. The first one is called the strict secure. This is a protection against network attackers. The idea is that if you have uh, uh, a secure cookie set uh, in a context of a site and the network attacker tries to toss a cookie with the same name from a non-secure origin, okay, that cookie is discarded. So you, you can't do cookie tossing uh, against the secure cookies from a network attacker position. The second uh, and most important protection here, cookie prefixes will only focus on host cookies. The thing is, is that if you have a cookie having as a name a string starting with underscore underscore host minus, there are additional security restrictions imposed by the browser to that cookie. So you must have, you must set the path attribute to slash uh, the secure attribute must be enabled. Most importantly, the domain attribute must not be set, all right? So it's not possible for a subdomain attacker to toss a cookie from a subdomain position and scope it to the wall site. That's why we call these cookies high integrity ones or host locked. Now, have a look at this table. On the left hand side, there are different values for the set cookie header. And the first one is like set cookie foo equal which is serialized by Firefox and Chrome as the cookie request header foo equal, so perfect match here, all good. The name in the cookie jar is foo, the value is empty, and the server, in this case Werkzeug, which is the middleware used by Flask-based Python applications, uh, parses uh, the cookie exactly as uh, it is also stored in the cookie jar of the browser. Now, have a look at all the other values you might think that some of them are not valid headers. Unfortunately, all of them are valid, and they map to cookies without a name, but like with different values. The concerning bit here is that the cookie number one and cookie number three are serialized by the browsers exactly in the same way, but they map to different cookies in the cookie jar. The first one is a named cookie, having as a name foo and empty value, and the third one has 
not a name, it's like the empty string, and the value is foo equal. If you're wondering how the server will parse all these different cookies, guess what? They are parsed all in the same way because of vulnerabilities that we discovered on Werkzeug and we reported and got fixed. If the problem at the server side is due to some implementation mistake, that's not the case for the client because clients are following the standard and nameless cookies are a thing in the standard starting from 2020, including this serialization collision that we just mentioned. So the question here is, uh, what are the real world implications uh, of this, uh, of this uh, collision? Well, we can be passed off cookies, for example. The idea is that you can set a nameless cookie having as a value underscore underscore host minus then ses equal to bad. Uh, and you can set the domain attribute in this case. Why? Because the browser perceives this cookie as what it is, a nameless cookie and not an host prefixed one so no security restrictions are imposed by the browser. And as you can see, this cookie is serialized in a way that is not distinguishable at the server side from a legitimate host cookie. We reported this issue, it got fixed in the browser and in the standard, not in the way that we would have expected. So the reasonable way would be to nuke nameless cookies as a whole. Um, unfortunately, this, this didn't happen. And this specific behavior has been excluded. So now, if you try to set a nameless cookie, having as a value a string that starts with underscore underscore host minus, the browser blocks it, so it's not set. But since this is just like a, an exception rule and, and nameless cookies are still there, you can still use this technique to bypass strict secure cookies. Um, please check the paper and the artifact. There is way more stuff there. There are, we, we reported 12 CVs, 27 vulnerabilities. We have additional browser uh, issues, uh, server-side parsing problems, uh, and clients and server discrepancies. We also have a measurement on cookies uh, for prefixes, nameless cookies. What we understood is that nameless cookies are mostly a byproduct uh, of configuration mistakes. Uh, and we also have formal models of the patch web frameworks that we analyzed uh, using Proverif. Thank you very much for your attention, and that's the way the cookie crumbles.